Hello, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion of opioids and context-sensitive halftime. This is recording part three. Now that we've talked about all the strong opioid agonists, we're going to talk about other drugs that work at the opioid receptor. Partial agonists, as we talked about in the first set of recordings, are drugs that bind to a receptor with lower efficacy. So in this case, we're talking about mu receptor partial agonists. Compared to morphine, they have a lower maximum effect, even at high doses, when given alone. And so these drugs are really good for controlling mild to moderate pain. So if you think about it, if you would give somebody a full agonist, like morphine, and a partial ag agonist, the partial agonist actually acts sort of like a competitive antagonist, because it blocks the full agonist, like morphine, from reaching all of the receptors. It competes with the full agonist for receptor occupancy, and we have a net decrease in the clinical effect compared with if you gave full agonist alone. So some people call this a ceiling effect, with the idea that it lowers the risk of respiratory depression, for example. There's still risk with these drugs, but hopefully a little bit less efficacy may add some degree of safety. We also expect some risk of diminishing analgesia when using partial agonists. And theoretically, there's even some risk of inducing a state of withdrawal when a patient who is very dependent on full agonists is given partial agonists. There are many examples of these partial agonist drugs. Some people call them weak opioids, although they are still very potent. Uh, codeine is a drug with good oral bioavailability. It's used as a cough suppressant and for mild to moderate analgesia. Codeine actually is converted to morphine in the body, and it turns out that about 10% of Caucasians are unable to convert that drug enzymatically. So if you meet patients who say codeine doesn't work for them, they may be telling you the truth. Codeine is often mixed with acetaminophen, and you'll see this with many of the partial agonists, that they have a nice synergy with acetaminophen to get a stronger analgesic effect without increasing the opioid risk. So codeine mixed with acetaminophen is called Tylenol number two, number three, or number four. Usually you'll see Tylenol number three, and these are just different ratios of acetaminophen and codeine. Hydrocodone, also called Lortab, and mixed with acetaminophen is called Vicodin or Lorset. Oxycodone and Oxycontin are the exact same drug. It's just that Oxycontin is extended release over 12 hours and Oxycodone is immediate release. And mixed with acetaminophen, we get Roxacet, Percocet, or Percodan. Tramadol was for a while thought to be not really an opioid, but in fact it does have moderate mu receptor activity. It's still much less potent than morphine, but it has other actions, including inhibition of spinal norepinephrine and serotonin uptake. Some of its side effects include nausea, seizures, and possible interaction with Coumadin. Finally, proproxifene or Darvon is a drug that you are unlikely to see much anymore. It was mixed with acetaminophen to get Darvacet, and it's been withdrawn from the U.S. market now due to an increased risk of arrhythmias. Looking at all these different opioids, we may want some way of converting from one or the other to the other or appreciating the relative um, strength of each drug. So first of all, there are a few rules of thumb. So when we're talking about IV drugs, there's a rule of tens, which says that 100 milligrams of meperidine is equivalent to 10 milligrams of morphine, which is equivalent to 1 milligram of hydromorphone, which is 100 mics of fentanyl or 10 mics of sufentanil. So that's a nice general rule of thumb. But if you want specific, um, accurate conversions, we use what's called an equianalgesic opioid dosing table, which allows us to convert not only between different drugs, but also between parenteral and enteral dosing. So for example, we can take morphine, 30 milligrams of oral morphine is the same as 10 milligrams of IV morphine. Then we can convert IV morphine to another drug like fentanyl, and that would be 0.1 milligrams of fentanyl. Whenever we decide to convert one drug to another, 
we usually cut the dose in half in order to account for the fact that patients may have more sensitivity to a new drug than they had to the old drug. Often you'll see patients in the hospital, especially post-operative patients, who have a PCA, a patient-controlled analgesic pump. This is typically an electronic infusion pump that delivers an amount of IV opioid whenever the patient presses a button. And it can be used for acute or chronic pain. So for example, post-operative pain management or end-stage cancer patients. The principles are that the caregiver programs the PCA to only allow delivery or bolus of an opioid dose after a set interval of time, which is called the lockout. If the patient presses the button during the lockout period, a bolus won't be delivered, although the machine will record that they tried to push the button. You can also choose to add to that a continuous basal infusion, which is running continuously. The advantages of PCA are that the patient can self-deliver their own pain medication and get faster relief of their pain. Since the pump keeps track of everything, you can accurately monitor their demand and the doses they received, and you can use that information when it's time to convert the patient to an oral or other longer-acting opioid regimen. The theory is that the patient is protect protected from overdose because if the patient is too sedated to press the button, then needless doses won't be delivered. But this advantage would be lost if anybody else, like a nurse or a family member, goes and pushes the button on the patient's behalf. Also, if a basal rate is being used, then the patient is receiving opioid continuously, even if they're sedated. Studies seem to show that patients use less total medication with PCA compared with cases where medication is given according to a set schedule by a nurse. Some disadvantages of PCA include that patients may choose to self-administer the pain medication for a euphoric effect, even if they don't have pain. Patients can be underdosed or dangerously overdosed if the PCA device isn't programmed properly or if there's a malfunction. And PCAs are inappropriate for certain patients, like those with learning difficulties or confusion, patients who don't have the dexterity to push a button, critically ill patients, and younger um, pediatric patients. Now let's move on to a different kind of opioid, and these are the mixed agonist antagonists. These are still substances related to morphine, and they usually bind at multiple different opioid receptors. Examples that you may see are nalbufine, butorphanol, and buprenorphine. These drugs, when given with a low dose of full agonist, are additive up to the maximum effect of the partial agonist. So this is the ceiling effect that we talked about before, where the drug has some agonist and some antagonist properties. If you pretreat patients with these drugs, you may be able to reduce or prevent the euphoria associated with morphine use because the mu opioid receptors are competitively antagonized. And so therefore, the notion with mixed opioid agonist antagonists is that they have less abuse potential than the full or the partial opioid receptor agonists alone. Let's see a few examples of these drugs. Nalbufine or Nubane is a strong kappa receptor agonist and a mu receptor antagonist. So the analgesic effect has to happen through the kappa receptor. And it is able to achieve similar analgesia to morphine, but with less respiratory depression, with the respiratory ceiling effect of about 30 milligrams of morphine, probably because of its mu receptor antagonist uh, properties. And in fact, morphine-induced respiratory depression may be reversed with a dose of Nubane without taking away their analgesia. I often see Nubane used to take away the pruritus associated with morphine that's already been given, especially in the intrathecal or epidural space. And we see this often used in OB anesthesia. If a patient is already dependent on a strong opioid like morphine or heroin, then Nubane could actually precipitate withdrawal because of its antagonist effects. By itself, Nubane has a low abuse potential and an elimination half-life of three to six hours. Buprenorphine goes by the brand names of Buprenex or Subutex. It is a partial mu receptor agonist and a kappa receptor antagonist. That's sort of the opposite of what we just saw with Nubane. 
Patients often take it sublingually to avoid that first pass effect when it goes to the liver. And this drug is notable for having a tremendous affinity for the mu receptor, about 50 times greater affinity compared with morphine. And so it has a very long duration of action because of its slow dissociation from those receptors. In fact, it's hard to antagonize this drug with naloxone because it has such a tight affinity for the mu receptor. Buprenorphine is usually used in patients who have chronic pain or patients who have opioid dependence. Since it binds more strongly to the mu receptors than other opioids, if the patient would choose to abuse other drugs, they will not experience any clinical effect or side effect from them. This has a negative side, which is if a patient comes for surgery and they're taking buprenorphine, our agonists that we want to give, hydromorphone or morphine, are unlikely to work because they have to compete against the buprenorphine, which is already bound to the receptor. And this can lead to uncontrolled postoperative pain. So we need to plan ahead when a patient is taking buprenorphine and is scheduled to have surgery. And unless the procedure will cause very little pain, like say a colonoscopy or something, or the pain can be adequately managed with local anesthetics, there are four approaches to dealing with this situation. One would be to wean the patient off the buprenorphine, and this takes at least four days prior to surgery. The patient could be switched from buprenorphine to another long-acting medication like methadone, which doesn't have as much of a tight affinity for the receptor. We could switch the patient from buprenorphine to another opioid agonist like morphine, or, if none of these are done, then we have to expect the patient will need very large doses of opioid in the post-op period, and this may need additional monitoring and specialized nursing care. Most PACU nurses aren't going to be comfortable giving 10 to 50 times the normal dose of opioid to control a patient's pain. Suboxone is a preparation that is buprenorphine plus naloxone. So what we've done is mix the buprenorphine with a pure mu receptor antagonist, and the idea is to prevent diversion for illicit use. So if the patient tries to abuse this drug, the naloxone will prevent them from having any sort of an effect. Speaking of that, let's talk about naloxone, also called Narcan. It is an antagonist at the mu, kappa, and delta receptors. And not only does it antagonize exogenous opioids, it even reverses the effect of endogenous opi opioids. This drug should be given carefully in order to prevent sudden severe pain and other side effects like hypertension, tachycardia, and even pulmonary edema. It will precipitate opioid withdrawal in patients who are dependent on opioids. And the way I usually give it is to take a one, one vial, which is 0.4 milligrams, and dilute it in 10 milliliters and then give 20 to 40 micrograms every one to two minutes and repeat until the clinical effect is achieved. Like flumazenil, this drug has a short duration of action, so we may need to repeat our dose or even put them on a naloxone infusion until the opioid that they originally received has worn off. Opioid tolerance means that patients no longer have the expected clinical effect to a given dose of drug. Tolerance occurs after about two to three weeks of continuous opioid therapy. Patients develop tolerance to analgesia, euphoria, sedation, and ventilatory depression. Most sources say that patients do not develop tolerance to the constipation side effects. Addiction, which is defined as a physical or psychological dependence, usually takes about 25 days to develop, but we now know that some degree of addiction or dependence can begin to form within 48 hours of exposure to opioids. Opioid withdrawal occurs when a patient who is dependent upon opioids no longer receives them. This presents as a severe flu-like illness, sometimes called the superflu, 
Patients have a runny nose, sneezing, yawning, lacrimation, abdominal cramping, leg cramping, piloerection, or goose flesh, which is probably the source of the term quitting something cold turkey, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and dilated pupils. In general, opioid withdrawal is not typically life-threatening. Dangerous effects like seizures, altered mental status, and hallucinations are all rare with opioid withdrawal. The worst symptoms occur within 72 hours after the opioid is stopped, but symptoms can persist for up to 7 to 10 days. One last point to make in this section is about opioid-induced hyperalgesia. This is the notion that patients who are exposed to opioids may actually have increased sensitivity at their nociceptive receptors. This seems to be more common with the phenanthrene opioids, drugs like codeine, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, morphine, oxycodone, and oxymorphone. It seems to resemble tolerance, that is, a patient getting a reduced analgesic response after being given a certain dose of opioid. But in tolerance, if you give more opioids, the pain should improve. But in opioid-induced hyperalgesia, the pain can actually worsen with increased opioid dosing. Also, opioid-induced hyperalgesia develops much more rapidly than tolerance, and the pain intensity is stronger. Why does this occur? There may be some opioid agonist action at the NMDA receptor, and not only the parent agonist, but its metabolites like morphine-6 and morphine-3-glucuronide. And this is supported by the fact that opioid-induced hyperalgesia is not relieved when you give a mu receptor antagonist like naloxone. The best treatment for opioid-induced hyperalgesia is to gradually reduce or completely discontinue the opioid medications. You may be able to switch them to a different class of drugs, a different class of opioids, some non-phenanthrene opioids. Addition of other non-opioid analgesics may be helpful, like NSAIDs or NMDA antagonists. And buprenorphine may also have a role in treatment of opioid-induced hyperalgesia. That's the end of this section. Please do contact me anytime with questions, and we'll see you in the next recording.